Is it really better being an entrepreneur in the United States than in Europe? Is the grass really greener on the other side of the Great Pond? Welcome to a new episode of the Life Science Get Together podcast. Today I will talk with Jessica Walsh, the founder and CEO of Rx Bands, about how great it is really is being an entrepreneur in the United States. In this episode, you will learn how entrepreneurs in America handle things, how it is to develop and grow a company in the medical device field, and how exactly you do it to nail a deal with the US Air Force and the American Department of Defense. Jessica Walsh, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be talking to you. I'm really honored. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I have so many questions. And the most pressing question on my end is, uh, I think for uh, all Europeans, uh, we always have a look at the other side of the pond. And uh, I very often here in Europe, everything is better in the United States. No. And one of the questions I would like to, to discuss with you in this podcast is, is the grass really greener on the other side of the pond? I, you know, I'd like to, to say that it is. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I can. I think anytime you're, you're developing a company, uh, it's, it's always a, a fight. Um, it, it takes a lot of effort, um, whether you're in, uh, you know, overseas or here in the U S I mean, yes, we're larger. There, um, may be more uh, companies that are there in terms of resources, but there's also a lot more competition as well too. Um, I think no matter where you are, it's, it's finding the right people, the right team, the right resources and, and reaching out. Um, some of my team members are actually uh, from overseas. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're pulling That's from over there as well, too. <laughs> we're, we're, we're reaching out worldwide. That's, that's very good to hear that you also have uh, people from Europe on your team. Uh, what, what is your company doing right now? Right. So our expands is a really innovative medical device company with patient centric auto injectors that are designed to deliver a wide range of injectable medication for, for people around the world. Um, for uh, us, it, it was important uh, to be able to help people who either have anaphylaxis or diabetes. We can deliver epinephrine or liquid stable glucagon. We're able to help the military uh, with either anti chemical warfare agents or um, for pain medication. So there's a lot that we're, we're able to deliver. Um, and, and that's what our focus has been on, is to really rethink and redesign uh, existing auto-injectors. I have one question to you. Um, when I researched it right, I think you founded your company in 2012 mm -hmm. uh, or 2013, around this right. time period. Right. Uh, what was the reason that you decided uh, to become an entrepreneur? What was this initial event that you said, okay, uh, I want to have my own company. <laughs> I want to go out on the market and uh, raise money. I want to experience yeah. the risky life of entrepreneurship. And eventually, <laughs> maybe somewhere 30 years in the future, uh, I become rich. What was, what was the initial event that uh, made you go in that direction? What were you thinking, right? Um, so uh, it was it was personal. Um, I found out I was allergic uh, to bee stings. Uh, I had been stung many times before as a child. I never had an anaphylactic reaction. And then one time 
uh, at night, I'm walking through the kitchen barefoot and I step on a bee. So not the place that you think that you're mm -hmm. going to get stung. I originally thought it was glass. And as I sat down to uh, pluck it out, uh, no sooner um, I had a massive anaphylactic reaction. And it's amazing how quickly it can come on. You think, you know, if I set my mind to something, I can accomplish anything. Yeah, that mm -hmm. is not one of them. Uh, so off to the ER I go and prescribe to carry an EpiPen with me, which is uh, similar to your jacks. I'm not sure if you, you've seen them, um, uh, but six inches long, right? Well. It, it's huge. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm allergic to bees. And I said, given the severity of your anaphylactic reaction, you need to carry this with you at all times. So I run and I'm thinking, okay, where am I going to put this? So I ended up duct taping it to my arm. Okay. I look ridiculous. I'm thinking, oh, you know, there has got to be a better way. And as I did research, I found two thirds of people who are prescribed to carry auto injectors don't carry them. Mm -hmm. uh, parents are fighting with their kids to carry them. One out of three are bullied in schools for having them. Oh. Um, Seventy percent of people don't remember how to carry them a year later. Um, and sadly, 40 percent who died of an anaphylactic reaction never got to their auto injector. It's because, you know, that two thirds of people who are prescribed it don't carry it and choose the risk mm -hmm. of their life. You think, well, OK, you know, it's, there's got to be something else out there. There's got to be better options. And I found that there, there really weren't. So, um, and on top of that, they're really expensive and they expire each year. So after having it, I said, hmm, you know, what is this made of, like gold? Let me take it apart. Because <laughs> that's, you know, what you do. You think, well, yeah. what's in this? You know, why is it so big? And I took it apart and I found the amount of medication that's injected is, is probably about the size of my pinky nail. So really? Be kidding. So if you've ever, like as a child, if you've ever had one of those boxes and the box is big and it's beautiful and you open yeah. up and it's tiny little <laughs> box, I was like, you got it. Like, when was this design? And it was back in World War II and it hadn't substantially changed since yeah. that time. I was thinking, this is really unconscionable. People are dying, their lives are at risk, and we're still carrying around something that was designed back then. I was just thinking, you know, look at what has happened with our phones in terms of innovation. If we were still carrying around phones that were <laughs> like, in the, like in the seventies, right? <laughs> the cord. <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> we have it. I was like, yeah. you know, even the latest model cell phone is too big. It's just like so. We like to think that our uh, we could do better, um, and so our team got to work and we we created our mini jacked auto injector so i'll show you here real quick so mm -hmm. we like to think of it as like the iphone cool. and phone booth it's so small so yeah. it's the world's uh, smallest auto injector right now Congratulations. Um, and it's really simple to use uh, uh, which is great because so many people don't remember how to use epipen a year later it's uh, you just pull off the cap press the person against the person injects and retracts in under a fourth of a second. So um, I was just really fortunate when I had that opportunity to open up that auto injector. And it was, you know, it's not just for me, but it, it's for everyone else who goes through that problem. Uh, you know, sometimes you need to be that change you want to see in the world. Um, and you built the team and, and got to work and that's how we started. So my cat is listening, so I hope that's it's not too great. disturbing <laughs> to the podcast. Uh, I, I want to jump a little bit uh, at the beginning of your company. You said you, you saw out of your own experience this huge problem in the world. Um, how, how was it then to bring it to life? 
how was it uh, was it easy to to find the right team for you uh, did yeah. you already have a team or how did you manage that from the step from having the vision and seeing the problem to basically starting to work on the solution and founding your team and getting a team right uh -huh. so i come from a construction and engineering and project management background i'm not a doctor not an engineer I wasn't in life sciences. Um, I, I, so I came purely from a patient perspective and a project management uh, uh, knowledge of how to build a team. You're given uh, a budget, you're given a timeline, a client, and you execute and you deliver. And so that was my expertise. Uh, bringing in people who knew how to do what I didn't know how to do and get them to work at their highest and best use to de deliver. Um, so utilizing those same skills, uh, we I built the team. Um, finding, I think, people who are really passionate, who care uh, about what you're doing is, is huge when, uh, when bringing people together it allows when things get difficult for them to still be inspired engaged and working for a greater good a bigger purpose that that larger goal to saving lives um, it, it's not saying if your engineer has no uh, skin in the game that they're still not going to be amazing but so I think that's some of what helps keep you going mm -hmm. when you're uh, a small innovative startup team um, the path to success <laughs> by no means is straight so it's it's executing every single day it's picking yourself up um, it's uh, there's times when it's exhausting and I think from a patient perspective thinking if you know, if I don't do this, if I give up, karma's probably going to say that I'll get stung and die. So let me keep going. But for people who who aren't coming from the patient uh, perspective, I think also talking to patients as well too. Uh, whether you're on the uh, therapeutic side and spending time, it not only helps you to understand who you're working for, but after I speak with the children who have anaphylaxis mm -hmm. or the parents who've lost their kids and they're like, this is amazing. Don't stop. It, it gives you, it gives you goosebumps. It makes what you're doing real. It's more than just developing springs and, uh, you know, needles and therapeutics. It, it really gives you perspective that, uh, and the honor to be part of a life science mm -hmm. where you're, you're, you're helping to change lives, to improve health, to, to save people. And I think that's um, one thing that all the entrepreneurs and, and life sciences have. And like, if you have an idea that can change someone's health, by, by all means, don't stop. It's, it's, not going to be easy, but mm -hmm. to keep that end goal in mind. So, um, yeah, it the path not straight. There, there's many times we've got stuck, um, but I almost I like to think about it as almost four wheel driving. If you ever think of a truck stuck yep. in the mud, yep. right? And if you just keep trying to plow forward, you're spinning your wheels, and mud is flying, and every way it is just. And you're just really spinning your wheels. Sometimes you have to back up. Sometimes you have to say, all right, everyone out, push. <laughs> and sometimes you have to go slogging through the mud yeah, yeah. to go say, hey, can you guys come help push? I mean, find, find those advisors, find those mentors who can, who can, even if it's in the moment in your journey, get behind and help push you or find that, that map, something that's going to give you that mm -hmm. grip and really get traction uh, for the moments. Sometimes you have to rock a little bit backwards to, 
to make that progress through your bumpy journey, you know, down through the, to the path towards your end goal. So, um, so yeah, no, the, the path isn't easy. Yeah. It's, it's not straight. Um, it takes a lot of work and hard effort, but man, is it rewarding. It really, really is. And, and when you're able to celebrate those successes, even just getting out of that one pothole, I mean, like, it's just take the time with your team. Like, yes, we did it. We all pushed together. We got it. I mean, even if it's not your end goal, like, celebrate those little, those little successes. It's, it's so key to the morale um, and, and, and keeping you going and, and people engaged and inspired. A very inspiring uh, speech. Many thanks for that. You covered, <laughs> yeah, you covered a lot of topics. I think one one thing that you were talking about is having a sound vision and a clear goal of what you would like to achieve and being really passionate about that. And I think the, the great thing in life science in our industry is that we really can help to save lives, that we really can help parents um, that their kids enjoy a life of health instead of suffering from disease. I think this is a, a huge advantage of being in life science. It really, if you've been given the idea, if I as soon as you should say, if you've been blessed with the a solution, I mean that could really change lives. I mean, that's an honor in yeah. itself. That's that's not something that comes to everyone and to think that you might stop because it's too hard. I mean, I'm here to say that, you know, I believe in you. You, you, can, you can do this. Um, most things worthwhile in life are, are not easy. I, God, they take perseverance, um, but don't quit. Oh, yeah. Right? This just bring in that the team bring in those resources you make that difference and having that clear goal of uh, picturing your therapeutic or your medical device at, at, and having that vision in someone's hand saving someone's life i mean um and and be open to your your vision changing and adapting and, and pivoting we, we didn't always look like this. Um, our, our original innovation was uh, more of a bracelet. Mm -hmm. And as we uh, spoke with more and more patients, they said, oh, this is a great idea. This is wonderful. Uh, we can put different covers on it. We can carry it and on our back. It's like, well, wait a minute. Uh, it's a bracelet. Oh, but I can easily put it in my pocket. So yeah, you, okay. you know, it's a bracelet. And it was, uh, we were working with the New England Pediatric Device Consortium at the time. We had uh, won this award where we not got just, oh, we were awarded a little bit of funds, but also resources that were wonderful. So they helped us pivot to really listen to our customers and say, you know, it's better but it's not quite there yet. So we've given it the accessory attachment so it can uh, clip to the back of a phone. Mm -hmm. It can clip to a waistband for that child who wears the sport shorts without pockets. You know, it doesn't necessarily want a bracelet on um, for it to go to the mom who always carries her keys but never finds her sunglasses, right? Like you, it's like, great, I want to attach this to my keychain. And it's mm -hmm. small enough that you can do that. So we, we had to be open to really listening. And sometimes your vision has to, has to change, has to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just as uh, for other companies, you've seen large companies that haven't pivoted and adapted. I mean, at least here in the U.S., we used to watch movies always in the cassettes that you pop in and you yeah. go to some place and you would get those. And now we watch everything online, but the companies that didn't adapt from going from that rental where you go into the store, right? They, they didn't. And 
and um, um, you know there there were names that were prevalent organization names that were huge that were well known to us that that no longer exist so so really listen to your patients really listen to your customers and 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 yes have a clear vision but be open to doing that um to making those changes and i think also when you're when you're making those changes make sure your your team can all move together um, when you uh, almost as if you're you're sailing and the wind changes mm -hmm. right like you, you you have to adapt your sails you have to uh reset you have to all move together there was this booms coming across everyone has to talk and That's be true. ready to move right otherwise someone gets knocked down yeah, yeah. flying out the boat and you have to stop and go back and be like hey <laughs> man overboard come back in you know pick them up and then move forward as the mm -hmm. as a team so you really want to be able to uh, move together as uh, as a team and absolutely and, and make sure everyone's ready and that they're sharing the same vision and that doesn't that doesn't always happen quickly yeah. sometimes it takes a, a lot of discussion and, and patience and um and, and a bit of time for people to get used to yeah especially i think i think i mean you point out uh, a very important part uh, a life science company is not a one person man or woman show so it always needs a team because we need so many skill sets we need so much work uh, to uh, get done that it cannot be done by one person only. And I think on top of that, uh, every time when uh, we found a company here in Europe, the difficulty is that at the beginning, there is a broad vision, but uh, money-wise, what I can say to the people, I mean, uh, on one hand, I need your expertise. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we don't have money to pay you right away. And the third part is ideally the founding members and the initial team also invests in the company. How did you handle, how was it for you, this, this uh, phase of inception? Is it easy in the United States to find co-founders and first team members who accept that they don't make a fortune in the short term? Or is it very challenging? Right, it's, it's not easy. I was very, very fortunate to find um, in the very beginning ways to be able to move forward. Um, so I initially, in the very inception, I uh, used online services such as Odesk and Elance to bring in resources that I need for uh, to get some of the work done. Um, or uh, Fiverr is another one where it's very affordable. You can bring in uh, people to help you execute, uh, to help share your vision, to help attract that core team. Um, one of my, uh, interestingly enough, again, one of my uh, first engineers was from overseas. Um, we, uh, I had helped with their website at the time i almost bartered they loved what we uh, we were working on they got involved mm -hmm. um being able to find people who were experts and cared and were uh, uh about what you were uh working on uh made the difference to to get them inspired engaged yes equity in the beginning uh makes all the difference they're part of it. They're part of the team. They um, finding people who are very skilled, who maybe are retired, and uh, have that expertise. Uh, wants to be able to utilize their skills to be able to help move you forward. Have that time. Are incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, they've already made their money. Uh, and you can you can bring them in, and they can help guide you because they've been there and done that and seen uh, seen that before is, is also very helpful. Uh, but it, the found the people who come in and initially aren't always the people who are are right for you as you develop. So mm -hmm. keep an open mind with that. They 
sometimes people come into your life or into your organization for a specific period of time and, and cherish that they were there and what they were able to contribute. And sometimes since your company grows, you may grow out of their expertise. Yes. And, um, and you're constantly iterating and, and bringing in new people. And, and, and sometimes it's the young energetic person who like, yes, they want to, uh, to, they're crazy enough to want to be part of a startup and, <laughs> and right. And they have that energy and, and a dedication to, to just keep fighting. So, um, so th that's really how I, uh, attracted different people, uh, through advisors, through, uh, different online resources. We were, we were lucky enough to, uh, as I said, we won a couple of awards that brought, gave us attention that helped us attract other people. Uh, some of those awards provided resources Great. as well too. So I can't say that it's, uh, you know, you go to startups are awesome. It, it's really, there's no one path. I think you have to find what really works for you. Um, and, and also figuring out what you need to execute. So saying, what is my wish list? I think next steps to be, I need, uh, engineering design and mm -hmm. uh, go out and find that. I need uh, someone who's an expert in epinephrine. Everyone you ask. Um, sometimes it's not their first introduction. Sometimes yeah. five or six just uh, introductions out. Just keep asking. Uh, ooh, I, I was searching for a, a key expert for our team and um, uh, there's probably uh, about four or five world experts uh, for, in what I was looking for. And I asked everyone. And uh, one day I, I got a call uh, uh, from this individual. And was like, oh my gosh, you're it's just like, thank you. you. You will be heard. I just, it's, it's keep at it. Yeah, they're, they're great points that you, uh, you point out. I like especially the part uh, where you explained that sometimes uh, when the company grows and uh, pivots or when it gets more and more structured, um, different personalities are needed. So people that were there at the start might not be the right ones when the company grows. And sometimes I see that people spend too much time in trying to change people in the company instead of exchanging people in the company for the good of it. Uh, how do you handle that when, when you come to that point that you say, okay, uh, one of your team members was good for the last two years because it was a certain situation and now you need a new one and let, to, uh, let the team member go. How do you handle that so that you still have this positive spin in the company? So they still, they still have value, right? If sometimes if you're bringing on in the beginning someone who uh, has the expertise, um, but maybe they're uh, retired and uh, they, they can help get you started, but might not want to do the daily grind that's required for a start. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's taxing. It's an effort. So, so know that. Have, have those conversations in the beginning. Say, okay, you're, you'll come in for this part for an equity basis and then uh, transition to an advisor. So, so you can adapt and, and change and say, great. They start off in, in a higher level position. You, uh, you get to the point where they're saying, perfect, we're going to move you to an advisory. They already have equity. They already have a vested interest. They already care about what you're doing and they're there, but maybe it's not for the, you know, the day in, day out, um, but uh, that appreciation for what they've accomplished doesn't go away just because they don't want to hold that uh, title. Mm -hmm. 
any any longer. Um, and you bring in, in someone new who, who does. Um, having those, again, good contract, good conversations lead to good contracts. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to um, have those conversations up front. Have the what ifs. What, uh, you know, whether your, whether your contract is uh, milestone based, um, with saying we want to want you to accomplish these certain goals and once you accomplish these goals you'll vest in your equity or maybe it's over time uh, that uh, as you spend time you'll vest um, over over that period uh, so there's many ways that you can then you can structure this so people feel appreciated yeah. and and involved it's good that you pointed out so it's not always higher and fire there are yeah. many ways to to uh, give uh, the relationship a positive spin as well so I, I like that you say you can always put people on advisory roles so maybe they don't like the daily grind uh, mm -hmm. and they are just better off if uh, they're only pulled in when their expertise is needed instead mm -hmm. of throwing task after task on them and making them fail Right, you know, and I've, I, I think I've been in those situations where you're thinking this, um, we're, now we're doing this and now we're doing that and, and not everyone can, can keep up and, yeah. and it, it, that was a learning lesson for me saying, well, great, we're going. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm like, we're, I, I told, we're trying to hold on to your coattails, it's your moving and and they can't not everyone can move at that at that speed and and it doesn't make them bad at no. all they definitely have value it's it's uh, it's having that right team yeah. and constantly adapting and, and evaluating um, I think this is this is one of the the, the most important uh, learnings for young entrepreneurs that uh, I think the technology by itself is only a small percentage of the total success. A lot of success is contributed by keeping the team spirit up and having these necessary people skills to keep people engaged and motivated and a positive spin in the company. Yeah, it's, it, it makes all the difference in, in keeping your team together, excited. So much of it celebrating those little successes, judging their uh, energy level. Uh, I, I know I use a lot of analogies, but if you've ever seen someone uh, jumping horses, um, mm -hmm. you, you have all of these hurdles that you need yeah. to get through. I love riding. And um, you'll often see the rider as the horse is seeing this jump coming in front of them and they're checking up and they're setting them up for this hurdle and and it's sometimes it's really necessary you just can't fly through everything you have to ch uh, check up get your team collected and say okay well, let's go let's make sure you know we're not flailing as we're trying to go clear these hurdles um and not everyone is collected you, sometimes you you have someone who's you know uh, uh, in, you, not quite in that mindset yet and yep. uh, that preparation that inspiration that encouragement uh, especially as a startup you're you're constantly pushing into into things that maybe you haven't done before that's that's it's great if you have an advisor, but sharing that belief of like, okay, we can figure this out, guys. Like we can do this, yeah. and 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 getting that team together to be able to move forward. I re I really love that part of entrepreneurship, um, getting the right advice. I mean, the first thing always is realizing that there is a problem, which which is not easy because an entrepreneur very often has to step into areas where he or she is not really proficient in. So there's this feeling first of, I know that something is not really right. And 
but I don't know whom to talk to because I really, I, I, it's, that there is something, but I don't see it. And I think this, uh, this skill to identify problems, to name problems are key to success for every entrepreneur because it's a pre-step to finding the right advisor. Uh, how do you handle that situations? Right. So, uh, problems. I think there's a, there's two. Uh, there's a mindset. I think there's two uh, different points. In the middle is somewhere. At least I found was right. That a lot of people will say, "Oh, uh, people are negative and don't listen to tell mm -hmm. to negativity and problems." And then I feel like you're just plowing forward and you're not really listening. When people say you can't do this for whatever reason, listen to those people um, and then solve the problem. So, I mean, because everyone, when you're starting, is just like, you know, there's huge pharmaceutical companies out there. You're never going to be able to do this. Ask why. Why I'm not going to be able to do this? Manufacturing is very difficult. Great. Let's go figure out manufacturing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for telling me why I can't do this. You're never going to be able to do this because of whatever reason. And there's a lot of that. And you, you can't just put your fingers in your ears and just, no, listen, really listen, but then, but then solve those problems and find the, those resources. And it's not always money. I think our first in instinct is to say, well, I need money to solve this problem. Yes, that's so helpful. It makes your life <laughs> really easy. But let, you, let me tell you, life is not always easy. And sometimes you have to be creative. So yep. um, maybe it's equity. Maybe you have some skill. Um, uh, you do anything that you're able to do that you can say, hey, I'll help you with this if you can help me with that. Um, and there, there's, there's more ways to move forward and solve your problems. No, absolutely. I think I think Grant Cardone said something like I don't I have, don't have the exact quote in my mind right now, but he said something like uh, if you don't like problems, don't become an entrepreneur. If you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you must love solving problems, and if you want to become more successful, you must enjoy getting bigger bigger problems on your table. So without Having this ability to love problems, entrepreneurship will never lead to success. It's good to hear that you see it similar. Yeah, you really, it's like, if you think of it as a puzzle, and, and if you think of each one as a learning lesson, I mean, you're going to make mistakes. God knows I've made so many of them. And, and sometimes you're really going to doubt yourself. And that's, I think that's the difference between yeah. you, you either stay down or you pick yourself up. Like you're going to be face down in that mud from pushing. You're yeah. going to flip. You're going to get dirty. You're going to be exhausted. But get back up. And sometimes you're going to be slower to recover. But look at, look at that as, hey, what did we learn? What did I learn? You know, if you... If you're afraid of making mistakes, it's something that, sorry, but you're going to have to get over it, right? Because no one's perfect. Anyone who's started any company has, has it's not been perfect for them. Um, it, it's, it's difficult, um, but you'll learn from it. And from that, you'll become stronger. And sometimes you're you're going to make the same mistake. <laughs> you're going to you have to repeat it work. until you learn it. <laughs> right. You're like, gosh, that one took me a while. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, for me, saying, oh, oh, I can do this. I can figure it out. Great. Well, maybe you can. But it's going to be a lot faster if you bring in the right people. That's true. I mean, like, maybe in the very beginning, I laugh when I think about this, like, well, let me see 
that if I can learn CAD, it's like, no, stop. Like, you're not going to become an engineer and do this mm -hmm. successfully. You need to bring in the people who, who, um, who can. And, and sometimes it's saying, you know, can, does it make sense for us to learn this? Uh, going through the FTA, for example, uh, they'll, uh, every step is very well laid yeah. out. I'm thinking, can, do we have the team the expertise to be able to uh, read through the um, their guidance? That's very well laid out. Can we can we follow the steps to register for our um, our application and get an application number? Can we like lo and behold we can? It, can we um, read through the requirements to send that first letter to them to explain what we're doing? We can. Um, so there's, and then you get to a point where you've made enough progress where you attract those experts and say, this is what we've done. Instead of having them do it, can you review it and see if it's yep. right? And that's a lot less expensive. So there, there are things that make sense for you to to try to, to figure to figure out. So don't be scared to try it, but, but keep it in perspective in, in That's true. what your team should and should not be doing. I think this point about failure culture is important. Um, when I think back to my days in school, it was very negative uh, to fail or to make any mistakes. So the, the reception by the teachers was generally speaking, not very good. And as an entrepreneur, we have to unlearn this because it's part of the game. Why? Is, what if I don't pass this test? What if I don't do this right? Uh, you know, even even when you're you're pitching and and, and um, uh, in competitions or whatnot, that 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 oh my gosh, what if what if I if I don't do well? What if I say the wrong? Yeah. You will, you will get over it, right? You're gonna, you're, you're, there's times that you're gonna be so scared. Um, so during our pre IMD meeting with the FDA, I like, I was, and then I couldn't sleep the night before. I, I before the meeting, I was like, my God, it feels so my stomach. I like, we're talking to the FDA. I, I was so, so scared. Scared, they were the nicest people. I mean, yeah. sometimes you have to look at the fears that you build up in your mind. I mean, you would have thought I was going into the lion's den and <laughs> was the biggest, scariest monster ever. I, I was just shaking. Um, and they were wonderful. They were so kind they were they say well you could do it that way or you may consider and then they gave us the most wonderful recommendations and advice and guidance and then you look at the, like, that's really what they're set up to do they're not there to to make you wrong or to hurt you that their end goal is to keep patients safe and for your device or you or what you're creating to um, to be safe and effective for use and they're really there to help you to do that and i said look come to us you know show us your plan and that's really what the pre ind meeting is mm -hmm. ask us your opinions and your questions we're going to give you guidance how to do this um, and then when you come up with your test plans, send it to us, we'll review it and we'll tell you if it, if it needs to be tweaked or revised before you start doing it. Um, and such a sigh of relief. I was like, my, and I had told them like, thank you guys after the meeting. So, so be careful about what you're building up in your mind or what other people are thinking uh more than likely they're not and um i i've had meetings where or i'm in on the stage and and 
and everyone, I was just, I just I thought, oh, they're, they're bored, they're not going to like what I, I'm talking about. Everyone else is doing something that's so much more interesting. And then I had a line of people coming up to talk to me yeah. after. I was like, they were saying, oh, we love this part. I was, I, you know, I was, you, you build things, especially as a new entrepreneur up in your mind. I would like to say, don't do it, you will. Try, try to remember. Give your best, yeah. Right, give your, cut yourself some slack. Really, please. We've I've, all been there. I think it's an important part that you mentioned that, that successful people, it's not that successful people are not afraid and don't have emotions and are always confident. It's just, they don't care. They don't give in. They don't give in to emotions and don't punish themselves unnecessary and stay home. They just get up and get out there. And of course they are scared. So going on a stage is always uh, something that's exciting, that is new, it's a new audience. And uh, it's, it's, it's normal, it's human to be afraid and to have fears. Exactly. It, it really is. And I'd like to say, don't do it. And, and you will, and that every entrepreneur's doubted themselves. Um, lean in, lean into it, recognize it, say, okay, why do I feel so anxious? Why do I feel scared? Well, I think this, and then you start to break it down. Yeah. It's really not as scary. It's, it's not giving into the fear. It's moving forward in face of that, because you, you will, you're going to doubt yourself. You're going to feel scared. There's going to be times you're feeling like you're going to be up in the middle of the night making the same what made me think that I could do this? Right, my gosh. And you're like, no, at least it's a, a, for me, it was, it was the uh, moms who had lost children. Mm. It was like, who, so please get this done. You'll find your, the thing that makes you get up and get moving when you, when you feel that you're stuck or you're scared that that higher and and from you know that's one thing really as we were saying before life sciences people wish to people are curing cancer right? yep. people are coming up with new therapeutics you're improving the quality of life keep going don't yep. stop what you're doing uh will not just change people's lives but their families too um, you know, babies and children and mothers and sons. It's just not just that one person. It's, and true. what those people will do. And, and now this is not to get your butt up on that stage, <laughs> right? Like, spend that extra hour, make that yeah. extra call, share your passion. We're really in a unique position uh, uh, to do that. I can absolutely agree to that. You mentioned in the talk that you had uh, FDA meetings. So I'm curious, at what stage is your technology right now? Is it uh, a working prototype? Is it on the market already? Where are you in your development? Right, so we're going through the FDA approval process. Uh, we were lucky we were approved for an expedited pathway. Uh, it's just called cool. a 505B2 which allows us uh, for our epinephrine auto injector we don't need to prove the efficacy of epinephrine for us that was a huge win the fda said look we know what the efficacy is of epinephrine in a glass cartridge delivered mm -hmm. in the you can uh, supplement your application with existing uh, studies uh, which was wonderful um, so we have to do our device performance testing, we have to do our human factors and then stability studies. So we were so fortunate in that regard. Um, we're also working uh, with the military as well. So we'll follow a, a path, similar pathway working with them. Um, and so we're fortunate to have just received a, a phase one contract with the military. Right. Uh, we've, uh, it was just just a huge 
a huge win for our part. Um, and, and that was one of the things we were thinking originally at the Nephrim Group, and we found, you know, we can help the military, whether it's anti-chemical warfare agents, okay. replacing um, uh, for our auto injector, we're following a pathway to deliver ketamine, which will be um, a safer, uh, more effective alternative for morphine. So we're, we're working to pursue that pathway currently. Um, we're, we're also working, we just found out just the other day, we were uh, awarded a, a contract with uh, the Chemical Biological Defense uh, Department of the DOD. Congratulations. Thank you. It was just huge for us. Some of the technology that uh, we're, we'll be placing in our auto injector to really make it a uh, shatter resistant, uh, shatter proof. So there's, we're finding that there's, there's many pathways forward. It's the auto injector, but then it's also some of the technology in the auto injector that has the ability to be licensed out. Um, we're talking. One question from my end. Uh, you mentioned that you have a contract with the U.S. Army and another contract, I think, with the DOD, if I got yeah, it right. Of course. Yeah. yeah. How, how did that work? Is it easy uh, to get this, uh, let's say, customer relationships built? Uh, or does it take a lot of time uh, from the first contact until you finally sign, sign the contract? So it took us a long time, um, but there are are faster pathways forward. So I'm happy to share some yeah. insights from our perspective to help future entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs um, that would like to work with the uh, US government. I am by no means an expert. I can just share our experience. Um, first, get registered. Um, there are certain requirements that you have to meet. They take some time to put into place. You have to have DUNS numbers. You have to be registered. Um, it's uh, once you follow the steps, it's very well laid out and you're registered and you're approved to work uh, with the uh, military. So I, I think the website is sam.gov. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a good starting place to get, in, uh, get your registration and all the uh, paperwork in order. From there, uh, working with the Air Force, they have a uh, PathWorks Challenge Program, which is an in uh, technology innovation part of the Air Force. So it's uh, it's actually called AFWorks, and I want to be able to share this with you guys. Mm -hmm. So it's A F W E R X Challenge dot com, mm -hmm. and so they put out solicitations for we're trying to solve this problem. So if you have a technology that can help uh, submit an application. And we want to see it. Uh, so they'll move you through phases. Uh, first phase would be phase one. Um, and they, I think they do them every three months. It's uh, like a 15 uh, uh, page uh, PowerPoint slide and a tech volume that's it's also short, probably another 15 pages. There's a couple of other documents it's not that bad there uh, they award them to companies that they find fit in uh, niche so they also do an open solicitation so if it's something they haven't thought of that they need they'll they'll um, have that opportunity to be able to mm -hmm. say hey this could help the air force in this way um, they're also doing joint ventures so even though it's AFWorks through the air force they, they bring in the Army and Navy as well, and they're through um, SBIR programs. So that's how they award the money, through a small business uh, innovation. Um, you have to meet certain requirements, it be less than 500 people, which for most startups isn't a, a problem. And um, so definitely, if there's something that, that you feel uh, could be of benefit, reach out there there's there's ways uh, to to do that um, even if the even if the company the startup is not a u.s based company so i think they're open also to european companies well, i i know that you have to meet certain requirements mm -hmm. i think work needs to be done in the u.s but you're yep. able to bring in more nationals so maybe find that 
strategic partnership uh, and say, hey, we have this, uh, we're an expert in this, and they, they mm -hmm. are great connectors and, and saying, uh, we have this expertise, you have the U.S. Mm -hmm. lab, we're going to work together yeah. and be pleased to do it. But initially it's about the technology and the benefit of the technology and mm -hmm. not so much about the location. So Europeans should not be afraid to reach out to the US Army or to the Navy mm -hmm. or the Air Force and should just offer their technology. And if there is something in it, there is always the possibility, of course, to uh, allocate operations in the United States. But initially it must not be founded uh, or accepted in the United States. Exactly. There, if you have something that would be a benefit, I mean, uh, th there's ways to accomplish that. I, I know one of the requirements, at least um, that the work needs to be done in the U.S. Finding lab space here isn't difficult. Um, registering for a corporation here isn't difficult. I mean, there's you can do it on. I uh, we're in New York and in Texas. It's um, it can be done online. Uh, there's mm -hmm. there's innovation hubs where they'll rent space to you. They'll uh, rent lab space um, in uh, special development areas that are, are set up specifically for startups. So if we love to attract new businesses uh, and bright entrepreneurs, so come. You know, uh, bring uh, bring your innovation and technology, make a difference. There's so many resources um, uh, going uh, through some of the better business bureaus for different states. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on where you want to be, there are a lot of places where you can, you can help you. We were talking about problems uh, in the middle of our talk. What problems are you currently working on that you are looking for support and help? Uh, we have a huge life science get together network. So maybe there is somebody in the network that might be of benefit for you. Uh, what's your number one problem that you currently are working on? Right. So we're always looking for uh, great people to, to build upon our team. Uh, people who are experts in combination products, uh, auto injectors in particular, we've worked on an auto injector, uh, whether it's through the regulatory pathway for CE Mark, um, uh, through China, um, internationally, we're interested. If you are a licensing expert, we're looking to license our bottle injector to large pharmaceutical companies who um, have innovative or their therapeutic that they want to deliver. Um, our, our cartridge has a 1 ml glass yeah. cartridge. Um, as a standard, it's a glass, so it delivers and retracts in under a fourth of a second. So for emergency use indications, um, we're looking for to connect with pharmaceutical companies. If you're an entrepreneur who's looking for a drug delivery, you have a therapeutic and you need a drug delivery device, we're not going to say no, you're a small, uh, you know, innovative, uh, you know, therapeutic. Absolutely not, we'd love to work with you. Uh, we're just closing out a round uh, where we will be closing it in September 24th. So. We still have that convertible debt note open. Mm -hmm. We've got great terms. So if, um, if an investor is interested in participating, we are closing soon. We'll fit you in. Um, and uh, for them to reach out to me, my email is jessica at rxdanzbandz.com. With the consent, I will put it into the description of the uh, of the podcast, so your contact data that people can directly reach out to you. Thank you. Uh, one last question. We're at the end of uh, this episode. Uh, one last question to you. So let's assume that you can go back in time uh, when you were in your late teens, early 20s. Uh, what advice would you give your younger self with the expertise and the experience you gained? Uh, build teams. 
that your team is critical. Ask for help. Ask. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, I, in the past, I think what took a uh, took a longer period of time than it really needed to be is trying to figure out things yourself. Thinking, money. Uh, you know, let me uh, bootstrap. Yes, bootstraps. The uh, bootstrapping is great, but bring build that team. You, people will be interested. They will care. Um, and, and build that right team. So that's really, if I could go back in time, I, I would have, we would have made a, a lot more progress, a lot faster. You, if you didn't feel, oh, I've got to figure out everything. You really don't. But it, bring in those, bring in those experts uh, and, 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 and really listen and, and keep, the, uh, keep your team inspired and, and engaged. Don't be afraid to reach out to them. I think that's one of the things that I also did wrong is, is oh, I don't want to bother them. They're my advisor, but I, you know, I, they're a really important person. I, I, but then they, I think often they didn't feel needed or connected or, or possibly as appreciative or appreciative. Or, and, um, and so by keeping them engaged, um, I, I could have done a better job than that. And I think that was an important life, life lesson, along with not being afraid to, to fail. So I guess those are a couple of like, yeah. like, <laughs> You're right, I Jessica. I, I took, I took <laughs> five or 10. I could go on on the, on the things that I've, I've learned that, you know, where could I start on the things that I wish that I had done better mm -hmm. to get to this point, right? There's, there's, there's no shortage of that, but, you know, you move, you keep moving. True. Jessica, thank you very much for your time. It's always a huge pleasure talking to you. I wish you all the best for your company. Keep on moving forward. I think your technology is very much needed in the world. And uh, if anybody in the audience uh, has something to offer or can help, feel free to reach out to Jessica Walsh. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please, please share the podcast and make sure you've subscribed. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.